scripture, Isaiah 43 and 19. God woke me up with this at 5 a.m. this morning. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Not as it might. Not we're going to see. But it springs. It's happening. It's going on. You can't stop it. Now it springs forth. Do you perceive it? It's happening whether you acknowledge it or not. There's a breakthrough whether you accept it or not. There's healing whether you want it or not. Will you not give it heed to it? So will you not decide that I'm going to embrace this? I'm going to embrace the new wind. I'm going to embrace the breakthrough. I'm going to embrace the healing. I'm going to embrace the deliverance. I'm going to embrace the prophetic. I'm going to embrace the intercession. I'm going to embrace the calling that God has put on my life. Will you heed it? Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. And we're going to ask God to set us on fire this morning. How many of you want to be set on fire by the Holy Spirit? Now, I don't have drums in here today, so I need us to go old school. Put your hands together. Foot stomp. If you believe God,
Hallelujah. We need the Lord to wrap us up in his arms. Amen. Come on and worship him. Come on and bless him. He is worthy. He is a worthy God. He is a worthy, worthy, worthy God. You're worthy, Lord. We love you, Lord. Yes, you're worthy. Hallelujah. the victory for you in situations. with the fruit. 
fruit of your lips. Come on and bless him with what's in your heart. Decree and declare unto him what he's been to you. Oh, come on and lift those hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. For he has won the victory for you. He has won the victory for me. Jesus the Christ, he has won the victory for all humanity. And we worship him this morning. Hallelujah. We adore our God. For our God, he is strong and he is mighty. Hallelujah. Our God, he is faithful in all of his ways. How many of you believe he's a faithful God today? How many of you believe he's a faithful God? The Bible says to a thousand generations, our God is faithful. The Bible says, great is thy faithfulness, O God. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. He is a faithful God today. And we rejoice in him. Hallelujah. He is a faithful God today. And we celebrate him. We celebrate him in spite of it all. Hallelujah. In spite of our situations and our circumstances. He is worthy of praise. Glory and honor today. And we thank him this morning. We thank him from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The Lord's name is worthy to be worshipped and praised. And we bless his holy name this morning. We honor him as a faithful God. Hallelujah. I said we honor the Lord as a faithful God. He is a faithful God. He is a faithful God. He is faithful even when we are unfaithful the Lord is still faithful to our families he's faithful to our children he's faithful to a thousand generations he's faithful yes he is this morning he is faithful he is faithful in all of his ways we excite we celebrate and we exalt our faithful God he is worthy this morning, people of God. He is worthy of all the glory and the honor. Truly the Lord is worthy of all the praise. And we take the time to celebrate him on this Sunday morning for his faithfulness towards each and every one of us. If you believe it today, come on and give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house of the Lord. Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We are gathered here, not for form or fashion, but we are gathered here to worship you. For Jesus said it to the woman at the well for the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So we're here to worship you this morning. We're here to worship you in praise and worship, singing and celebrating and lifting hands, but we're also here to worship you in the Word, God. In every area and every aspect of our lives, we want you to fill us with your Word, fill us with your love, fill us with your grace and your mercy. You are worthy of all that we can give you and so much more. We will never be able to praise you enough or worship you enough. If we had 10,000 tongues, it still wouldn't be enough. But God, we give you what we have to give today, which is our very best praise, our very best worship, because you have been faithful to us. In spite of all that we've been through, you've still been faithful. Hallelujah. And we thank you for it even now. Now, God, prepare the hearts and minds of your people for the word of God today. And even those that do not know you as Lord and Savior, 
we pray that this will be that day. This today will be that day that they will receive you as Lord and Savior of their lives. Only you can save, only you can deliver, only you can set free. We pray for families in this house and throughout this nation. We plead the blood of Jesus over families, over children, over singles, over married couples. We lift them up to you, Lord Jesus. Because we have all been created in your image and in your likeness. And we bless you, Lord Jesus. For our households and we bless you for our children we bless you for the families that you connected us with we bless you even as singles because we are part of the family of God we bless you today whatever our status is we bless you today because you are worthy of the praise father we pray for our seniors we pray for our seniors Lord those that or in that golden age and years of their life. Caleb was 80 years old, but he said, I still want my mountain. Hallelujah. In other words, God, he said, I still want what you promised unto me and my family. Bless our seniors, oh God. Bless those that society sometimes forgets about. Bless them in a special way. We thank you today. We praise you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on and shout hallelujah unto the, unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You could do better than that. Come on and shout hallelujah unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we welcome you to Love Fellowship Church today. We truly believe that if God has led you here, you're not here by accident nor by mistake. Amen. But we truly believe that God has a rhema word in store. And we're just so thankful for you and your families coming out and celebrating with us today as we celebrate our God. Amen. All of our uh, uh, minister Raquel. Amen. Raise your hand if we have any youth that are children ages kindergarten through fourth grade amen we want to make sure kindergarten through fourth grade sister Raquel is in the rear amen she will be teaching today are the teens being no okay all right no teen church today amen praise the Lord well we had a power pack weekend amen this weekend it truly was a blessing to be able to minister to the community in different ways that we don't often get to do amen this this, this Friday, we kicked it off with a singles fellowship. Come on, shout out all the singles. All the singles. And we were just so honored to have the singles that were able to come and be a part of this first singles fellowship since the pandemic. We haven't had one, and this was a beautiful time for Pastor Renee and I to meet and greet singles and to really just hear what was on their hearts and just to celebrate them for their singleness. Amen. And so we thank God for all the singles that came out. Then on Saturday, we were able to uh, provide a very impactful and informative workshop on Medicare part, on Medicare, really, all the different parts of Medicare. There are about four or five different parts from A to B, C, and D, and on. But we were able to provide a very impactful and informative workshop. And if you missed it, amen, prayerfully, there'll be some more coming. But we were thankful to be able to do that. Uh, we had lunch, we had breakfast for all of the participants, and that was truly, truly, truly a blessing all in itself. Amen. So I thank God for Pastor Renee, who really worked tirelessly to pull that off on yesterday, and we thank God for her, and we thank God for all of those that came out and were a part of this, uh, this Medicare workshop. Amen. So a power pack weekend that we had. So we started this series last week entitled Family Matters. Everyone say Family Matters. I truly believe that families matter. How many, how many believe that today? Amen. 
we started it and we began to speak about things pertaining to the family. 100%, listen to this, 100% of ministry centers around relationships. If you think about what happened last on, on Friday, singles, that was about relationships, amen. On yesterday, the Medicare, part, the Medicare workshops, that was about relationships. Reaching people of different ages, different demographics, different groups, different perspectives. It was all still about relationships. There would be no need for a house of God if there were not a need to build up families and relationships. But our number one relationship, our most important relationship, most of you already know it, amen, is not with families, it's not with friends, but it's with God, our creator, the architect of our lives. How many of you agree with that today? That is our number one relationship. And with his son, Jesus Christ. But equally, amen, we must state that below that relationship, that vertical with God and Jesus, is this horizontal relationship that we experience with our families. And today, we want to take it a step further and a step deeper, looking into some of the impact that families have on society, both good and not so good. Amen? Amen. When we think about family relationships, we must realize that there is a real crisis going on in society right now. There is a real crisis that's brewing in the world when it comes to children, when it comes to marriages, when it comes to families. In 2019, I'm going to give you a statistic here. In 2019, there was a study done by Forbes that revealed 70 to 80 percent, watch this, 70 to 80 percent of Americans, of people in the United States of America that considered their families dysfunctional. They did a survey and they had different aspects of what dysfunctional families were and they asked people to be honest in their responses. And what they found, what Forbes found was that 70 to 80 percent of the people that did this survey considered that there was some sort of dysfunction, not in somebody else's family, but in their own personal family. Think about that for a moment as you look at your own family. I look at my own family. From, amen, from birth to the family that I have with my wife and my son. And I have to admit that there was dysfunction in the family. This word dysfunction, don't be afraid of it, but it's real. It speaks to a breakdown in the family. In the family unit, it speaks to deficits in the family. And when we teach on this dysfunctional family for a moment, I don't want you to look at it as just from a negative perspective. But please look at it as an opportunity to overcome some things in your own families. And an opportunity to help somebody else overcome some things in their families. So can we look at it from that lens? All right. Amen. The first point I want to make, I made several already, but just from the perspective of dysfunction, is that there are many different causes of dysfunction. And I want to give you a few just so that we can paint a proper picture. Amen. Many different causes of family dysfunction. And this is not an all-inclusive list, but this hopefully and prayerfully will get you to start thinking. Number one is rejection. Being rejected 
whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, whether you are a, amen, family member, whether you, whatever your position is, rejection can produce dysfunction. Number two is healthy, unhealthy rather, communication. Number three is verbal abuse. Now, amen, you, you don't have to look funny, amen, when we put these out there. Just look straight ahead if it's hitting you, amen. But verbal abuse is just as toxic as the next one, physical abuse. Because when people are destroyed by words, there was an old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. That's not true. Amen. I was listening to a podcast and I was listening to it and it was talking about these kids in the South Bronx that had challenges with self-esteem. And they had went to a school about four or five miles away in the Bronx that was a private school. And when they went to the private school, they realized how much of a deficit it was between their school in the South Bronx and the private school that was four or five miles away. The school in the Bronx, South Bronx, didn't have a library. The private school four or five miles away had a library. The school in the South Bronx didn't have all of the support classes and uh, uh, counselors and, 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 and all of those support mechanisms that the private school had. And one of the things that the podcast focused on was one young lady who was in the South Bronx school that visited that private school that ran away after seeing the disparity between the two schools. And when they interviewed her years later, she not only didn't run away from that, that school exchange experience, but she ran away from high school, period. Because she saw herself as not worthy enough. She saw herself as less than. And it stemmed from the home. And when they caught up with her 10 years later after that experience, she was a very smart girl, but the seeds of, of negativity that were planted in her head made her think that only, the only thing she was good for was serving the people that she considered better than her. They interviewed another young man that was also a part of that private public school exchange. And this young man was a was, was adopted, he was a foster kid that was adopted, but he was abused. And he was able to make it out of the South Bronx for a year or two. But the abuse caught back up with him. And he went to this private college, but he couldn't cut it because of what was in his head. The dysfunction that he experienced in his life was, it was like it was a grip around his future. And he couldn't get past his childhood. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about family dysfunction. Sexual abuse. We don't like to talk about that in families. We don't like to talk about it in the church. But it's real. And we can't cover these things up because age will never shake your experience. Let me say that again. You could be 50 years old, but if you were abused as a six-year-old child and you never got therapy or you never got deliverance, you're still dealing with that. And it is affecting you no matter what age you are. And think about the people that filled out this survey. We don't, I don't know, and we don't know what their dysfunction was, but I have to assume that these things were a part of it. And how many of us have 
buried the stuff that has happened to us in our families. How many of us have said, you know what? That's another part of my life. Is it, I can't do anything about it, and I'm just going to move forward. But you're really not moving forward. Because what you experience can still haunt you without deliverance. Now, I know you want a shouting message today, but this is a helpful message today. Abandonment. Everybody say abandonment. Abandonment. Amen. Feeling neglected and, and, and all alone. Re even you can be in a house, but yet still be a bad feeling abandoned by your family. Isolation. Addiction. Adultery. Now, when we think about addictions, we think about, amen, drugs and alcohol. And yes, that's certainly a part of it. But pornography is an addiction. And pornography is just as toxic as sticking a needle in your arm. Mental illness. And maybe you didn't have it, but your mom had it. Your dad had it. But yet, there was a transference of something on you. It painted a picture. It left something, a mark on you that you, some people may not be able to shake. It's real quiet in here. The lack of love. I don't know any child that doesn't want to feel the love. Of a parent, the love of a family member. But there's so many children that wake up every day without that love, let alone the love of God and His Son Jesus Christ. And then this last one is the financial support, the lack of financial support, the number of 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 kids that grow up in homes where they eat cereal for breakfast, lunch, and dinner is unreal. And with the price of milk going up, they may be eating it with water instead of milk. See, in the house of God, in the body of Christ, we forget that these issues are real. And we want to cover up our issues as if we were not affected by any of this stuff. But how can people get real deliverance if they don't see real deliverance? How can people get real healing from their emotional state of mind if they don't see real healing in their emotional state of mind? Shouting and dancing is wonderful. But that alone can't bring deliverance when you have scars of abuse. When you have scars and trauma of mental illness in your family. And you still wake up at night thinking about the, the, the insecurities of not knowing if you'll have a place to live as a child. But these things have to be discussed. They have to be discussed. If we're going to be the true body of Christ. But I want to submit to you as we get into the word of God. That family dys dysfunction did not start with the pandemic. And it didn't start when you were born into this world either. But family dysfunction started in the garden. Amen. See, this is a systemic thing that Satan has released that's still being released and running havoc on people's lives today. Tell your neighbor, stop the cover up. Turn with me to Genesis chapter number 3 in the 
Amplified Classic. Are you with me today? Amen. In Genesis chapter 3, in the Amplified Classic version, notice what the scripture says here. And I'm reading out of verse number 1. It says, now the serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? And the woman said in verse 2 to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit from the trees of the garden, except, notice this, except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God has said, the woman said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now that should have been in the end of the discussion, amen? That should have been the end of it all but notice verse number four but the serpent <laughs> satan said to the woman you shall not surely die here is one of the biggest deceptions of the enemy is that we can see destructive behaviors but you, yet we listen to the wrong voice that tells us well you can partake of it and it won't mess you up It's a deception. Teenagers are deceived when they hear people say, oh, you can take a hit at this and it won't affect you. Young girls are deceived when they hear that young man talking into their ear or even that young lady talking in their ear and say, we can do this thing and it'll only make you feel good. See, it didn't start with the smooth operators. It started with the one and only serpent named Satan. It didn't start with the drug dealers, the pimps, or the child traffickers, sex traffickers. It started with the number one decept deceiver called Satan. So here he is showing his true color in Genesis 3 and verse number 4. But the serpent the Bible says, said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Yeah. Knowing the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. And the woman saw that the tree was good. See... <laughs> Adultery looks good until you get caught up in that thing. And then you realize how destructive it really is to the family. Smoking that blunt looks good and smells good and sounds good until you le it leads to other things that are very destructive for a lifetime. Sex before marriage, oh boy, it feels good. Until somebody gets pregnant. Or gets an STD. God forbid, monkeypox. See, Satan has a way of painting a picture that always looks good just to hook you into something that really is destructive for your life. And so it says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good, suitable and pleasant for food, and that it was delightful to look at, and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she gave some also to her husband and he ate. This is the worst tragedy of the family. Is when the door is open, 
wide open for Satan to come in. And if you notice, the woman led the way with the conversation. But the man didn't have a backbone to stand up to the woman. See, if I'm going to be a man of God, I must have backbone. To when I see inconsistency or wrong things happening in my family, I just don't take a blind eye and a deaf ear to it. I just don't let it pass and let it slip. Because it will come back to bite you. Verse 7 says, then the eyes of them were both open. Both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron-like girdles. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Why could they hear God before Satan showed up? You want to know one of the reasons why? They were distracted. They were more focused on themselves and their relationship with God. Because if Eve and Adam were really focused on their relationship with God, they would have never allowed the entertainment of that distraction. Satan brought a distraction. And they wanted to be distracted. They thought God was boring. They thought what God was saying was not good enough. They thought God was holding them back. But God was really saving and protecting their lives. And it's interesting that we, we, when, we're, when, we're, when we're going to do our dirt and do our thing that's against God, we never consider what God has to say. But the minute we get in trouble, now we can hear God. We know how to pray. We know how to fast. We know how to cry out. We know how to ask for forgiveness. We know how to ask for mercy. I told you this stuff happens in the garden first. It happened in the garden first. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Only if they would have heard it when the distractions were there. Satan will always try to pull you away from the things of God. He will always try to pull you away. Watch this. Could they blame Anybody for what they did? I'm going to go there. Could they really blame Satan, Adam and Eve, for what they did? Because Satan never put his hands on Eve or Adam. He never held a gun to their head. He never robbed them at night point. He never locked them up in a room and, and, and withheld the key. He simply planted a seed. And that same seed of destruction is still being planted in the hearts of families today. Youth and teenagers and young people and singles and married couples. Be careful of the seed that you receive. Be careful of who you allow to plant seeds in you. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, verse 8 says, in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called. Everybody say he called. 
this, this really hits me. This speaks to the faithfulness of God. God could have just walked away from them. He could have just destroyed them. At a moment, they just dropped dead. Yeah, they could have just dropped dead. But watch this. If they would have dropped dead, we wouldn't be here today. In other words, God had family in mind. He had family in mind when he created Adam in his image and in his likeness. He had family in mind when he created Eve. And they were going to have to pay a consequence and a price. But because of God's faithfulness to the family, you are still here today. Verse number nine says, but the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Or Adam, where art thou? He said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The world, the famous words of God. And he said, who told you, Adam, that you were naked? Who told you, people of God, that you couldn't hear from God anymore? Who told you that God couldn't turn that situation around? Who told you that God doesn't love you and can't do what you need him to do? Who told you those lies? Who planted those seeds in your head? Who told you? Because when we start talking like something that's different than God speaking through us, then you got to wonder who you've been listening to. Who you've been talking to. Who you've been receiving from. Because this ain't God. Every now and then, when I get off track, I got to think back. Now, what have I been receiving that I should have been rejecting? The Bible says God is faithful to a thousand generations. And even though Adam and Eve messed up and was jacked up from the floor, he was still faithful to them. Because he could have killed them. But what he did was correct them. You didn't hear what I said. God could have killed you. But all he really wants to do is correct you. So you can get on the right road. You and your families. I get it. Adam and Eve didn't understand what they didn't understand. But they needed to understand that, that, that God knew better than them. We need to understand that God knows best for us and our families. Again, in verse number 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, God already knew they ate of the tree. But it's something I said last week when we started the series. God wanted them to admit and commit. Anybody remember I said that last week? You, if you want to turn around, you got to admit and commit. 
admit where you veered off and you've done things wrong. Admit where you made mistakes and then allow the Holy Spirit and the word to correct you and commit to a better way of living. A better pathway of life. So that was what God really wanted from them. And the man said it was the woman. Wow. It was the woman, God, that you gave to be with me. Stop blaming other people for what's going on in your head and what's going on in your life. Now, I'm going to put an asterisk there. That's not to negate what I said about dysfunctional things happening in your family. Because when you've been abused and when you've been misused and all of those other things, yes, it, that's real and you got to deal with that. But everything is not a blame game thing. Because what you can do is you can get in a cycle of behavior where it's easy to blame somebody else and make them the fall guy to really look yourself in the mirror and say, what is wrong with me? Sometimes we have to look at the inconsistencies of our own life and say, why am I so inconsistent? Adam refused to look at the blame that should have been placed on himself. And he wanted to blame God and he wanted to blame Eve as if he had nothing to do with it. If there is a shortcoming, and there are some shortcomings in my marriage and in the raising of children in my household, I can't put that blame all on my wife. In fact, I have to own it first. Because as a man, if I can't own it first, then I'm teaching them how to cover up stuff. The blame game. The blame game didn't start when you were born or when you got to be a teenager. The blame game started in the garden. The finger pointing to somebody else other than yourself started in the garden. There are things that I absolutely experience, and I won't name them. In some occasions, I have named them as a child, things that I went through, and there are things that I went through as a young adult uh, that have, that really I had to get some serious deliverance from. But one thing I've learned is that I do less blaming of others now. Because once I get my deliverance, then I need to walk in my deliverance. I say, once you get your deliverance, then you walk in your deliverance. And now you can let Whatever they did to you, be released from you through the blood of Jesus Christ because his blood came to deliver you. Now, if you've not gotten to that stage of deliverance yet, yes, there's still some blame game and still some toxic stuff that needs to get rooted up out of you. And that's real, and I don't doubt that. But you got to admit and commit. Even if it's admitting I need deliverance. And I got to look myself in the mirror and see who's looking back at me. Because you, if you are afraid to deal with who's looking back at you when you look in the mirror, that's your first problem.
You don't like what you see when you look back in the mirror at yourself. You got to deal with that. Because that will handicap and cripple you until it's properly dealt with. And there's no better way to deal with that than to admit I need deliverance from these things. Some things are called strongholds because we hold on to them so strongly. You didn't hear what I said? I know that messed up your theology, amen. But if I'm holding on to the child abuse or the sexual abuse, if I'm holding on to the, to the abandonment, if I'm holding on to anything that caused me to feel less than as a kid, then guess what? I am in a stronghold because I'm holding on too strong. When the Bible says, cast all of your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you, he loves you affectionately. I pray this is helping someone today. One thing I tell married, uh, uh, pre-engaged or uh, uh, people that want to be married, I say two broke people will never make a whole marriage. And invariably when I say that, they always think about money. And I'm never talking about money. What I tell engaged couples or couples that want to get married or, or singles that want to get married, get whole. Because as long as you're broken and you connect with another broken person, you just got a broke down marriage. You just got a broke down relationship. And the world has plenty of that. What they need to see is wholeness in home. Not brokenness. The Bible says be anxious for nothing. In Philippians chapter 4. But through prayer and supplication. With definite requests. Make your request known unto God. I would say to singles. Don't be anxious. To jump into a relationship. Be committed to wholeness. Becoming the best you that God created you to be. And what you will find in that is that there's a satisfaction. There's a fulfillment. There's a joy that comes when you are whole that no opposite sex can ever give you. And you can be at peace even in an apartment all by yourself. If you're whole. Now, if you're not whole, then Satan can always trick and deceive you and offer you stuff that you think is good, but it's really for your destruction. Everybody say wholeness. God wanted Adam and Eve to be whole. It wasn't that he was trying to restrict them from eating of that tree and the fruit of that tree. He knew the consequences that they couldn't handle if they didn't. He knew that if they began to listen to Satan, the serpent, then they would get so far off track spiritually that they would turn their back on God. The one that created them in the first place. We cannot allow ourselves and our families to get off track spiritually to where God is just a check in the box exercise. We're just checking boxes. Because when we do that, then we set ourselves up for dysfunction and destruction. And so it says in verse number 12, 
It says, and the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, to be with me rather, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, or he cheated, outwitted, and deceived me, the Amplified Bible says, and I ate. Everybody's pointing fingers at somebody else. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all domestic animals, above every wild and living thing of the field, upon your belly you shall go, and you shall eat the dust and it and what it contains all the day of your life. And we know what it says about Eve. And we know what it says about Adam. God corrected them severely. But he didn't destroy them entirely. Wow, don't miss that. A lot of people read this text and, and, and they read what happened to Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden. They say, oh, well, God is, God, God didn't love them. God, no, he, he, if he didn't love them, he would have destroyed them. And none of us would be here today. Because these are the forefathers of all of us. The foremothers of all of us. Out of this seed of Adam and Eve came humanity. But God understood that they had gotten to a place where they refused to submit to him. And as a pastor, I've seen it in my years of pastoral ministry where people get such a big head that they forget that there's a God above them. I don't ever want to put a complex on people. That's why often I'll say publicly, I'll tell on myself, I'll, I'll admit, you know, I messed up here, I messed up there. Because I don't ever want anybody that listens to whatever God has given me to think that it doesn't apply to me. Everything that I'm teaching applies to me. And it applies to Pastor Renee. And it applies to our children. Everything that I'm teaching applies to my household as well as yours. Because the truth of the matter is, pastors can have a God complex. Anybody ever heard of a God complex? And that's a dangerous place. But that's what Adam and Eve were dealing with. That's part of the reason why they got kicked out of the garden. In addition to their disobedience, when they ate of the fruit, they began to have this God complex as if they were just like God and just can do what God can do. And God said, I can't have that in the garden. I can't have that because it will destroy the future of mankind. God had a vision for you. And in order to keep Adam and Eve in, in, in at least the vein of procreation and being allowed to procreate, he had to kick them out of the garden. Because if they would have stayed here, we would have had to destroy them. Because you can't, there's no equal to God. I know there's a lot of teachings and doctrines that say that you're equal to, there's no equal to God. He's in a class all by himself. Amen. I said God is in a class all by himself. I'm not in the God class. I'm in the human race class. I'm just like you. I need God too. Whenever we think we don't need God, that's a God complex. That's a dangerous place to be. We're being deceived by the enemy, Satan. But I got good news. God is still faithful. Amen. I said the Lord is still faithful. Turn with me. How many of you believe he's faithful today? To a thousand generations, God is faithful to our families. Isaiah 49, starting at verse 14, God was dealing with the prophet Isaiah. 
he was dealing with them about the children of Israel, the nation of Judah. He was dealing with them about their dysfunction. And what were the results of their dysfunction? He was prophesying that the nation of Israel, because of their dysfunction, would find themselves in captivity. But he was also letting them know how faithful he would be to them. In Isaiah 49, starting at verse number 14, it says this in the Amplified Classic. But Zion, Jerusalem, her people as seen in captivity, said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. That was the mindset that they had, that God had forsaken them and had forgotten them. But notice verse 15, and the Lord answered, or his response, can a woman forget her nursing child? Now, I, I, I've, I've seen some horrible stories on the news of women putting their children in trash cans after childbirth. I've seen horrible stories of women abandoning their children, leaving them with strangers, and never coming back. And the Lord asked the question in Isaiah 49 and 15, can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yes, they may what? Wow. God knew that what happened in the garden was what we call a generational curse. The seeds of disobedience, the seeds of the blame game, the seeds of not taking ownership and accountability for your own responsibility to your own children, your own households, those seeds passed down for generations and now the prophet Isaiah was having to speak to those seeds that originated in the garden that's why we had to read Genesis first so you could see where the blame game started originally when a mother would choose drugs over milk and diapers that's dysfunction. When a father or even a sperm donor would walk out on children and say they're not his, that's dysfunction. So the Lord asked the question, they were blaming God. They said, the Lord has forsaken us. The Lord has forgotten about us. So the Lord said, okay, let's go down that road of blaming others. So amongst you, amongst your women, amongst your children, amongst your family, Zion, Jerusalem, Israel, do you have any women that have ever forsaken their own children? Do you, in other words, do you have some dysfunction in your own household? And before they could answer it, the Lord said, yes, through the prophet Isaiah. Yes, they may forget, but notice what he said, but I will never forget you. Wow. In other words, he had to level the playing field. He had to let them know, listen, don't put me in the class of man. My, I am greater than man. I am not dysfunctional. I am God. Sometimes when you grow up in, a, in, in a, a lifestyle where there's constant dysfunction, you, you have issues with trust. 
because, and I get it because you've been let down so much. You always think somebody is scheming and plotting and there's some negative thing behind the goodness that they show you. And it's hard for you to believe that it can just be done out of the goodness of their hearts. It's hard for you to believe that anybody could really care for you and love you without wanting something from you. Or without using and manipulating you. And that's the mindset of the children of Israel at this time. That it was hard for them to believe that God simply loved them. And simply wanted the best for them, even though he still had to correct them. And God had to level the playing field in verse number 15 and let them know, I'm not the one that abandoned you. I'm not the one that dropped you as a child. I'm not the one that neglected you. I'm not the one that hated on you. I'm not the one that lied on you, mistreated you, verbally abused you, sexually abused you. I'm not the one that manipulated you. Don't put me in that class. That's not who I am. And I will say to you today, don't ever put God in the class of man. God is not a man that he should lie. The Bible says neither is he the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, that settles it. So God was letting them know, I will be faithful to your family. I will be faithful to you. Even though some of your mothers weren't faithful to you. Even though some of your fathers were not faithful to you. Even so, some of your kinfolk were not faithful to you. He said, don't put me in that class. See, we ought to be shouting and dancing over that because God is in a class all by himself. That's why the Bible says, great is thy faithfulness, O oh God. Great is thy faithfulness. At the age of 19, I was ready to commit suicide. At the age of 16, I was having suicidal thoughts. It was about this function. It was about this function. And I was drinking and I was doing stuff, trying to ease pain that came from this function. medicating in an unhealthy and ungodly way that would be destructive to my future because of dysfunction. And some of you know what I'm talking about. But God knew their dysfunction and he wanted to make it crystal clear that I am not the author of your dysfunction. Notice what it says next in Isaiah 49. In verse 16, behold, God says, I have indelibly imprinted, tattooed. You see that? <laughs> he said, I tattooed a picture of you on the palm of each of my hands. We walk around and we see people tatted up and we say, well, I like it. I don't like it. But God said, I got a tattoo of you on my hand. I look at you each and every day. Can you imagine? God is tatted up with you. God is tatted up about you. Well, pastor, I don't believe, I don't believe that's how God tattoos. Well, the Bible said he got a tattoo of you on his hands. Now, I'm not advocating for tattoos, but I am advocating that God knows you best. He said, every day I'm looking at you. 
and I'm loving you. Wow. I said every day, God is looking at you and loving you. If only you could learn to love yourself. If only we could learn to love the God that loves us. All of that confusion, it, it may not go away overnight, but it would go away. When I saw that, it blew my mind. He said, behold, families, I indelibly printed, tattooed a picture of you on the palm of each of my hands. Isaiah 49, 16 in the Amplified Classic Version. That's what it says. He says, oh, Zion, your walls are continually before me. We're talking about family matters, amen? So notice what he says in verse 17. Your children and your builders make haste. In other words, they get in a hurry to come to me. Your destroyers, he's talking about it, their enemies. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste go forth from you. God said, I know how to push the enemy away from you if you just love me. If you just connect to me and make me first place in your life. See, we try to make it so deep sometimes when it comes to our relationship with God. When it's really simple. He says in verse 18, lift up your eyes round about you and see the returning exiles. This is Isaiah, as God speaks to him, he's prophesying to the nation of Israel. He's saying, listen, there's going to be returning of those that are in captivity. And they're going to be ready to build Jerusalem. And all these gather together and come to you as I live, says the Lord. You, Zion, shall surely clothe yourself with them all as with an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. In other words, he's saying, listen, victory is coming your way. You're going to be able to wear victory. You're going to look like victory. You're going to act like victory. You're going to talk like victory. Just like you put an ornament, an earring in your ear, victory will be clear. You'll be able to see it, and others will see the victory in you. Victory! 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 God said, I want you to look like victory. I want you to dress like victory. Not like you're in bondage. Not like you're in exile. Not like you're a reject. Not like you're an afterthought. But look like victory. The victory that God gives, the world can't give it to you. Man can't give you that caliber of victory. So think about it, think about it, think about it. God said, I'm going to tat up my hands with your picture. Think about it. So God had no shame in showing whoever that you belong to him. And then he goes on to say, and when I bring you out of what you've been in, when I deliver you out of the stuff you've been in, he said, I want you to have no shame in letting this world know who brought you out, who brought you up, who gave you victory. God is not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of displaying his love for you. Don't be ashamed of displaying your love for him. Everybody say victory. victory. So it goes on, and we're almost done. He says, For your waste 
and desolate places. And your land wants the scene of destruction. Surely now in coming years will be too narrow to accommodate the population. And those who once swallowed you up will be far away. In other words, what the Lord was telling them, he said, get ready, because where you were in times past, it's too small for where I'm about to take you. The places that I'm about to take you are bigger than the places you have been. And I want to prophesy to somebody in the house today, you've been in a small place for too long. God is about to enlarge and expand your territory. He said it's too narrow to accommodate the population. In other words, he said there's going to be an explosion of families that worship and adore me. He's going to right the wrongs. God was telling prophet Isaiah, tell my people I'm going to right the wrongs. There's going to be an explosion. And the Lord told me, he said, son, he said, all I need my people to do is keep living and loving me. And the explosion of families shall come in. God is saying to us that trouble does not have to last always. In verse 20, he goes on as he's speaking through the prophet. The children of your bereavement, born during your captivity, shall yet say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me. Make room, everybody say make room. Make room for me that I might live. Maybe you missed that. But what he was saying was, he's talking about the families. And what he was saying was, this word was not just for an adult. It was for the teenagers. It was for the middle schoolers. It was for the primary and elementary schoolers. That they would all see my love. And they would all wear my victory. And they would all prophesy that God is going to take us higher than our enemies can hold us back from. He said, even your children will catch hold of this vision and say, you know what? God is making us, he's enlarging our territory. He's making us bigger than we've ever been. Now that's when we have whole families. When the parents and the children are talking the same things. On the same page. Worshiping the same God. Walking in victory because they know where their victory came from. That's functional families. And that's what God was speaking to. He wasn't speaking to, amen, just, just one adult here. He was speaking to the families. Then he goes on to say, then Zion, oh Zion, you will say in your heart, who has borne me all these children, seeing that I lost my offspring and am alone and barren and unfruitful, an exile put away and wandering hither and thither. And who brought them up? Behold, I was left alone, put away by the Lord, my husband. From there then did all these children come. Verse 22, thus says the Lord God, behold, everybody say behold. Behold, I will lift up my, my hand to the Gentile nations and set up my standard, underline that, and set up my standard and raise high my signal banner to the peoples. And they will bring your sons 
in the bosom of their garments. This blew my mind. And your daughters will be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be your foster fathers. My God. He was saying the ones that just tried to captivate you, they put you in bondage, will be the ones that will have to raise you up and treat you like they, you are their own child. He said, I'll make kings your foster parents. Because see, they had a fear in the earlier verse that God would still forsake them. And God said, let me tell you how I'm not going to forsake you. I'll make your enemy your footstool. The ones that kept you in captivity and bondage, I'll make them the ones that have to raise you up the right way. Again, in verse 23, and kings shall be your foster fathers and guardians. And their queens, your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. And you shall know, the Bible says, with an acquaintance and an understanding based on and grounded in personal experience. Listen to this, that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. That I am the Lord. For they shall not be put to shame. Who wait for, listen to this, look for, <laughs> hope for, and expect me. My God, the Lord is saying, is anybody in this house willing to wait for, <laughs> willing to look for, <laughs> willing to hope for, and willing to expect greater from God? If you are one of those people, you ought to rest on your feet today. If you want your family to go to the next dimension for God to enlarge the territory, God is saying here, you got to wait for it. You got to look for it. You got to hope for it. And guess what, baby? You got to expect it. You got to expect God to move. You got to expect God to do exactly what his word says. You got to expect it. Or are you just expecting things to remain the same? When God was telling them that the place you came from was too small from where I'm about to compare to where I'm about to take you. When God was saying that to them, he was saying, get free. Get free from the pain of your past. Stop seeing yourself as that 12-year-old girl. Let go and let God. Let go and let God have his way. I love how he concludes in that last verse, in verse 23, that latter part of verse 23. He said, he said, I am the Lord, and they shall not be put to shame. Speaking of the families that will put their trust in him. But they need to wait for it. Patience is a virtue that we cannot afford to do without. We need it. The Bible says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Then the Bible says, look for it. <laughs> I'm reminded of what the psalmist said. Look unto the hills, hallelujah, from which cometh your help. Your help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Then he tells the prophet, amen, tell him to hope for it, prophet Isaiah. My Bible tells me that our hope is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Hope in God make him not ashamed. The Bible tells me that God would give us a future and a hope. Then he says, expect, expect. 
expect me. Expect me. Wow. He didn't say expect the prophet or the pastor. He didn't say expect the apostle or the bishop. No, he says expect me. He said, I take ownership for your life. I take responsibility for your family. He said, expect me to do it. I decree and declare expectations as the birthplace of miracles. But if you're not expecting anything, you're not believing anything. And if you don't believe and expect, nothing will ever happen. You must have expectation that God is still God and he can do what his word says. If he promised it, don't forget what he promised you. Expect God to move. Expect the miracle to manifest. Expect the prayers to be answered. Expect the healing to show up. Expect the restoration of your children, your sons, and your daughters. Expect God to deliver what he said he would deliver. Don't give up, in other words. Don't give in, in other words. He is the Lord. Wait for him. Look for him. Hope in him. And expect him to do exactly what his word says he will do. Lift your hands in the air. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that every person, whether they're young, middle-aged, or in their golden years, this word was for them. Whether they're raising children or they're single, this word was for them. No matter what their status is in life, this word is for them. Lord, let them have an expectation of you to perform and as the prophet Isaiah said to hasten to perform your word to get in a hurry to do what you promised Lord even as their eyes have been opened through the word and their ears have been touched to receive the word of God today I pray that they would practice waiting for it looking for it, hoping for it, and expecting you to move. Now if you're here as we're praying right now and you got a burden I'm not calling what that burden is but I heard the Lord say to call those to the altar that have been carrying a burden, whatever that burden is, the Lord says expect him to lift it now the Lord says he's going to lift the weight off of your shoulder. He's going to remove the burden that you've been carrying for such a long time. But you got to admit and commit. Hallelujah. So we invite you to come to the altar. If you know what that burden is, we're not going to ask you. I'm just going to pray for you. God is going to do the real work. Amen. But it takes you expecting it. A part of you expecting it is a step out. If that's you today and you say, Pastor, I, I, I've been carrying this thing and I'm ready to get released from it. I'm ready to get it off my shoulders. Come to the altar right now. I believe there's somebody in this place that God is speaking to you right now. He's speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking. Don't let that burden remain. Don't leave out of here still burdened the same way you came in here today we can slide down and we can slide down just a little bit amen God wants to lift that burden off of your shoulders he's given us the prophetic instruction he says expect me hallelujah expect God to do what only he can do in your life expect the Lord to move 
in that situation. He is not through with you yet. It ain't over. God says it's over. I'm going to take you back to what the prophet Isaiah said when God gave him that word. He has tattooed your face on his hands. He sees you every day. Not only does he see your in outside, he sees your inside. And he brought you to the house of God. He brought you to hear this word. So that you could have that expectation that you need. That God is still able. Wait for it. Look for it. Hope for it. Expect him to do it now. I believe by faith that your expectation is that God can remove it. It's about to manifest. In fact, it's happening right now in the name of Jesus. It's happening right now in the name of Jesus Christ. There's a turnaround. There's a manifestation. There's a lifting of that burden that only God can do. If he's done it for others, guess what? He can do it for you. When I ask you to lift the hands in the air, it's just a simple act of surrender. Saying, God, not my will, but thine will be done. So if it's just one hand you can lift, lift that one hand. If it's two hands, lift that both hands. But just identifying that God I'm surrendering this burden to you right now in the name of Jesus I'm surrendering this heaviness to you right now I'm surrendering this weight that I've been carrying around I'm surrendering it to you because I can't hold on to this thing any longer it's too heavy for me it's weighing me down it's weighing my family Father, in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare right now that you are no respecter of persons. Zion was caught up in dysfunction. Zion was caught up in things that caused them to be put into captivity, disobedience and sin. But yet, because of your faithfulness to Zion, you told Zion, Zion, wait for it. I'm about to move. Zion, look for it. I'm about to move. Zion, hope for it. I'm about to move. Zion, expect it because I'm about to move. Lord, these people that are at the altar are representative of Zion. <laughs> the people of God hallelujah they know and you know what they've been carrying on their shoulders the weight that has been burning them down in their hearts and in their minds father we pray right now in the name of Jesus that there will be not only a physical lifting but there will be an emotional lifting there will be a spiritual lifting to where when they lay down tonight that thing is no longer the main thing on their mind in fact they're casting their cares on you right now for you said in your word in 1 Peter the 5th chapter cast all of our cares upon you for you care for us we pray in the name of Jesus that these cares that they've been carrying, that they would leave it at this altar now. That they would not pick it back up. They would not take it out of this sanctuary with them. Satan, we serve you. Notice, we kicked you out of their cars right now. We kicked you out of their bedrooms right now. We kick you out of their homes right now. You won't be able to set up shop and wait on them to come back.
because the place that they were before is too small now. God is enlarging and expanding their territory. So I speak to every demonic demon that has been assigned to each and every one of them to destroy their minds and their futures. I speak to every demonic demon just like the serpent came to Eve and Adam I speak to you serpent you have no authority over these people you have no authority over Zion they belong to God and not man your seeds of deception will not prevail in their hearts and in their minds we speak up against the generational curses the hurt and the pain the dysfunction that they've been plagued and burdened with release them now in the name of Jesus release them now God release that hurt and that pain Father, I pray for the children, those that have children. I pray that even their children would have a release as the word of God said. Bring forth and pour out your anointing right now. Right now at this altar, God. Pour out your spirit upon them. Fill them with your power and your Holy Ghost. We thank you now. We decree and we declare that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. No weapon formed against their households, their families, their children. The generational curses they're being destroyed even now I speak wholeness wholeness over their lives God wholeness over their futures God I speak wholeness in each and every one of them right now in the name of Jesus. Mm. I heard the Lord say. Go ahead and let him work through you. But the Lord says. Before you leave this altar. Go ahead and let him work through you. You don't have to leave right now. Let him work through you. Symbolically release whatever it is at the altar just symbolically just release it symbolically just release it see expectation you can't see it but it's tied to your faith it's tied to your faith it's not what you can see but what you can believe because whatever you believe, then you can receive from the Lord. It's tied to your faith. It's tied to your faith. Work through them, Lord. Work through them. Work through them. Work it out, Jesus. Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. God, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Deliverance is happening. Deliverance is happening.
See, we talked about deliverance when we first started this message. And God is faithful to his word. He's bringing deliverance. He's bringing deliverance. Let the delivering power of God manifest. In the name of Jesus. Deliver, O oh God. Set free, Lord. Breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your delivering power manifesting on today. Thank you, Lord. We thank you that we will wait on you. We will hope for you. We will look for you, Jesus. Most of all, we will expect you to do what your word says you will do, oh God. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We bless your holy name. In the name of Jesus, we exalt you, oh God. You are worthy of all the glory, all the honor. You are worthy of all the praise. Yes, fall on us, Holy Spirit. Fall on us, anointing. Let your anointing fall fresh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Have your way. Have your way in the house of God today. Oh, we bless your name. We praise your magnificent name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. have a child that wants to be saved. Amen.
Come on, let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank the Lord for what he's doing and what he will continue to do in our lives. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have an opportunity, uh, a special, as you're preparing, uh, ushers, if you can uh, share, if they need offering envelopes, amen, they can come and you can bring those to them, rather. I'm sorry. Amen. It's thinking about too many things, but we do have an opportunity to give out today, award a $500 scholarship, amen, to a deserving young man, Jaquez Scarborough, who is a freshman at Winthrop University. Let's give Jaquez a hand. As you may know, or maybe you don't know, since the early beginnings of this ministry, of this, of this ministry, we have given out $500 scholarships to deserving college students through the EHF Scholarship Fund. EHF stands for Edith H. Frazier, which was my grandmother, who sent, amen, 11 children to some form of college, even though she never graduated high school. And so, in the tradition of the EHF Scholarship, we are so honored to be able to award Jaquez Scarborough this scholarship. But I wanted to share a couple of quick things about him. Number one, he says that his favorite scripture is John 8 and 51. Number two, he says that his goal is to please Christ and live through him. And to focus on God rather than anything else going on around him. And then he allowed God to give him that sense of peace and normalcy, even in the midst of the pandemic. Amen. So at this time, uh, I think Ms. Scarborough, Ms. Scarborough and Jaquez, please come forward. Amen. At this time. And let's give them a hand as they come forward. A handsome young man. And we are so honored to be able to award this scholarship to you and to continue the tradition of investing in young people's futures as they endeavor to do great things for the, for the Lord and for their communities. And we pray, young man, that you will continue to focus on excellence in all that you do through Winthrop University. Don't allow anything, especially Satan, as we talked about today, to distract you from the goals that you set out to achieve. And we will continue to pray for you as you go out through, through your college journey. And mom, we thank you today as well for bringing Jaquez and how you raised him to be a fine young man. And we are so thankful to be able to be a blessing to you and your son. Come on, once again, let's give him a hand. I wanna pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Jaquez. I pray that learning would be easy. Even on the campus of Winthrop University, he will not allow distractions to cause him to get discouraged, but he will continue to press forward. He will wait for you. He will look for you. He will hope in you, and he will expect you, God, to do great, and mighty things in his life. Now order his steps, Lord. Lead, guide, and direct him by way of your Holy Spirit. And we will continue to pray that at the end of that four-year journey, he will be a better man, and he will be ready to go out and do all that you called him to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Well, at this time, if our ushers can gather the offerings, amen, from around the sanctuary, amen. We are, we are always hopeful and thankful whenever we have the opportunity to give because God loves a cheerful giver, amen. And this is our moment and our opportunity to give. You can give online 
if you desire by going to the Love Fellowship Church website and clicking on the Give Now tab. Or you can give here in live service. You can mail in your gift to our P.O. Box. There are multiple, multiple ways to give. But most of all, God desires for you to give today. Amen. Every gift is designed to advance God's kingdom here in the earth realm. Every seed financially that you sow is designed to advance God's kingdom here in the earth realm, here in the greater Charlotte area and around the world. And so we want you to know that it is opportunity time to give. Amen. And Deacon George, if you can come forward at this time, everyone resting on their feet as Deacon George is coming forward. Amen. If you would stretch your hands toward the basket, we're going to pray over our offerings. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for every gift and every giver on today. We pray that you would take these seeds, that you would multiply them and use them for the upbuilding of your kingdom, the advancement of your kingdom, God, and most of all for the the saving of lost souls. Lord, we thank you that every gift, every giver will receive a hundredfold return on that which they have given today. And it is in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray and all in agreement. Come on and shout hallelujah in the house of God. Amen. If you would, just take your seat just for a quick moment. If you guys could show the anniversary flyer, and then after that, we'll show the other flyer. I want to make two quick announcements. Number one, Love Fellowship Church will be celebrating 14 years of ministry on October the 2nd. At the 10.30 a.m. worship celebration, we have uh, Pastor Curtis Harvey, J. Curtis Harvey, all the way, amen, from Dothan, Alabama. He will be here 